if faith is required to enter the new season of God, and if we are indeed in a new season of God, then it's important not only to understand what faith is, but it is equally important to understand what faith does. How are we affected by faith? We, we saw in the previous broadcast that faith is the substance of what we hoped for and evidence of things that we have not seen. Now, the substance is the reality of what God told us He was going to do actually materializing or coming into being not necessarily visibly, but coming into being nevertheless. And the, the reality is the new season and comes with the economy, the dispensation of grace or the season. So when God tells us something before it happens, we carry it in our beings as a hope. At that juncture, hope is not wish. Hope is the certainty that what God has told you will come to pass. The only issue is timing. Heaven and earth would pass away before that which God told you would not happen. And again, this is both the personal, that is what God tells you personally, as well as what God is saying corporately. Now, it's important that you understand that God will tell you things personally, but it is equally important that you understand that God will tell you things through another. Because faith, you see, comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, not by reading. Faith comes by hearing, requires you to be listening as opposed to reading. This is a great problem for the Western Church, Church of Europe, the Church in Europe, the United States, North America in general, because we're an information-based society. We're information-based societies who believe that the information may be acquired simply by reading getting materials on the subject. Faith comes by hearing. That's because there is a requisite preparation that goes with someone who comes to bring the Word. Sometimes the Word is so upsetting to the season at hand that no one would voluntarily uh, migrate to another season just because they're looking for new thrills. If you think about the large Pentecostal and charismatic denominations, or even denominations like the Methodist, to whom the Holy Spirit initially came through the likes of John and Charles Wesley, they have they have frozen in time, building up traditions as bulwarks around the ongoing revealing of the Word of God. And now the traditions largely determine what these people and their, the leaders and their followers believe. So faith requires you to hear what God is saying by somebody through whom God is speaking. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing. When the Word that God sends you is, re is, is received in you, faith first takes the form of a hope. The child gets a promise from her father for 
for her birthday, the child now believes that on her birthday this promise will vest. The hope will become the reality. But faith then is the foundation of all of this. Faith comes by hearing. You begin to have faith when God speaks a word to you. When faith comes up in you, when faith arises in you, it arises in the form of a hope. Not a wish, but the certainty that that which God has said will come to pass. The the ancients were called men of faith even though they did not see the thing that God promised them become substantive. Abraham was defined as a man of faith, the father of faith, because God promised him that in his seed the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now God was promising him to bring Jesus the Christ through his line, but Abraham clearly did not live to see the days of Jesus, yet he died in hope. He lived positioning himself relative to what God told him he was going to do through him and with him. So Abraham did not live as a pauper, a beggar, a man without a destiny or a future. He did not live in depression and anxiety. He knew that he was carrying in himself the desired one of the ages. And for the duration of Abraham's life, he lived and conducted himself as a man of the greatest stature among men, because he had been given the promise. And that promise formed hope in him. Now, his entire mindset changed when he carried hope. Even when he carried hope, the first element of faith, the first appearing of faith in you is in the form of a hope based on what God told you would happen. Then you begin to act based upon what God told you he was going to do, as God ordains the timing of such actions. Now, when the hope becomes material, becomes the reality then and, and is evidenced so that you know it's not wish, it's not ahead of the time of God, the time has come, the season has come, the sun is born, the gift is given. When that's the case, you're in a new economy. Then you migrate from where you were to this new economy. But the first process of migration begins with repentance. Now at this point, you see, repentance is not repentance from sin. Now there's a repentance from sin, you understand. If you you do things that are wrong, you ought to repent. Repentance causes the thing that is wrong to have to fall away from you, often without consequence, often without consequence. But all repentance is not repentance, is related to repentance from sin. In fact, the majority of repentance has to do simply with overthrowing or unseating wrong mindsets. Because if a new economy has come, a new reality has come, and it's time for you to migrate to this season, what would keep you from moving into the new season? It would seem perfectly plausible that all you would ever have to do is mention the advent of a new season, and everyone would stream from where they were into the new season of God. First off, let me say, new seasons do not come so often. And in ancient times, they came even less frequently. It's only now that we're approaching the end of the age where the seasons change with the rhythms of childbirth, like birth pangs on a pregnant woman. But 
in antiquity, long periods of time transpired between significant incremental changes. But in this day it's much more rapid, much more rapid. But like I said, the first element of change then is repentance. Repentance is to understand first and foremost that the new season has come. Secondly, repentance is to realize that you have certain built up norms, certain expectations based upon your familiarity with the, new, with the old season. These familiarities may be familiarities related to custom, tradition, they may be rela related to just the inertia against changing, you, you like the familiar, you're uncomfortable with the unfamiliar, you don't want to venture out beyond the things that you're sure of, or they may be more sinister and more ominous, they may be related to demonic mindsets, they may be related to religious mindsets. All kinds of impediments make it not such an easy thing to quickly migrate from one season to another. This is reality. People operate this way but no one talks about it in these terms. When the new season comes, when you hear word of the new season, the first thing that you should do, the most elementary thing that you should do is repent. By the way, in the book of Hebrews chapter 6 that speaks of elementary doctrines, the first two elementary doctrines, the things you should always have known to do as a believer from your earliest training in the things of God were repentance from acts that lead to death and faith toward God. I promise you, that's what, those are the first two things, Hebrews 6. Elementary. These things should never be some great undertaking, some hand-wringing process. You should know that when the season changes and God reveals that the new season has come, you're through the transition, you're into the new season, your first response is to repent. Again, like I said, repentance may be moving away from inertia, moving away from tradition, moving away from just your, your preference for comfort, or it may be giving up mindsets that have become enthroned in you through demonic activity. Often these seasons bring great challenges and the challenge often that, that, that you face when a new season comes is to recognize that you've been entrapped in certain patterns of behavior, absent the grace to break free from them. See God will wink, God will at times wink at our inadequacies because the season does not require you to have any greater response to God than that. But when the seasons change, if there are demonic mindsets enthroned in you, whether or not these are habits, and in my teachings on repentance from acts that lead to death, uh, in the series on elementary doctrines, I emphasized how demonic mindsets may take may come in and, and uh, repentance is an effective uh, first step in turning away the, the authority of the demonic to oppress you. When you repent, the authority that was given, whether by you or someone who had the ability to give that authority over you, someone who had charge over you, when you repent or, and or when you forgive, you, you, you overturn that mindset that holds you in captivity and prevents you 
from being able to enter the new season. Repentance, of course, is bigger than just overthrowing a demonic mindset. Repentance has many other facets to it, but it is the thing you do when the season comes because it, the requirement is that you change your mind. Bottom line. You consciously... See, repentance is not something you can do accidentally. Repentance is a conscious taking of, of captivity, the thoughts and the intents of the heart that mitigate against the purposes of God. When you cannot do anything else, you can rule your own soul. The man in the, in the tombs in the country of the Gadarenes, no matter how possessed he was of the demonic, he could still cry out for help. So, whether it's to change habits and patterns and, and familiarities and preferences on the one hand, or to overturn demonic controls in your life, or, or to turn away from religious conditionings. Jesus once said that the traditions of men, and there he was speaking specifically of religious traditions, are the, uh, among the few things that, that nullify the Word of God. That very Word that produces faith, which lodges in you as a hope because God told you He was going to do this thing and you're waiting until He does it. You're waiting to and preparing yourself for when He does it. Then He does it and it becomes the material substance and you migrate into it by faith. You know the material substance has come because the evidences clearly and uncontrovertibly on a one-to-one -one comparison uh, tell you that the new season has come. So if the new season is about the day of salvation, then a Saviour will have come. Not an idea about a Saviour, but an actual Saviour. So the sign, the evidence, is the actual thing that has been prophesied now manifests itself. When the Saviour comes, you must choose. You could either go on with the religious sacrifices and the dietary practices and all of what was in type and shadow, the picture God painted for you, waiting until, you, until the reality for which you are waiting comes. When the reality comes, you're not better off staring at a picture. When the reality comes, you're not better off engaging in the rituals associated with the picture. When the reality comes, you're not better off engaging and indulging in the forms, the traditions, because these are the things that provide an opportunity for demonic invasion to take over and to capture you in, in the realm of your mind, in the realm of the mind. The battleground in which this battle is fought is in the soul, in the mind of the soul. That great change that needs to occur must occur in the mind of the soul. When that change occurs in the mind of the soul, repentance has occurred. You have changed your mind. When repentance occurs, you are then able to move easily into the new purpose of God. We must have the attitude then of pilgrims and travelers, not of settlers and occupiers. So we are always waiting to hear the word that comes from God knowing that it produces faith. Here I want to say something that is directly challenging, particularly to my Western audiences, who have come as far as knowing that you can hear God. To you I will say, it is imperative that you hear God, but it is also true that God does not say everything He's saying directly to you. 
particularly to the American audience. An American audience believes, the, among the subset of those who believe that they can hear God, that anything God is going to say, God will say to you personally, because it's their view of equality. Now listen, God is not obligated to treat us equally. That's a device of law, equal protection of the law, due process of the law, because the law is not our father and the law never can save a person. All the law is able to do is determine innocence or guilt. It's all the law can do. You cannot have a relationship with the law. So what God does is He gives us the specific things that we need and He gives us the grace that we need to operate in the season that we're called to. So when repentance is required, God requires a change of mindsets. And when you change your mindset, now you can enter into the purpose of God that God intended for you to have and to, to operate within. Now, I was explaining this principle the other day and this one friend of mine who is, who is a prophet um, got quite animated by it. He said, he went to a meeting and there was there were some other prophets there and one of them said, at the beginning of the meeting, he said, um, the word of the Lord for us in this meeting is to repent. And although this man is a prophet, he got pretty upset at the word because he said, every time I ever go to a meeting, I hear the word repent. And he said, I've repented of everything I can think of. And many things that I hadn't done, I just repent of anyway. Because if the word is repent, then I want to be sure that I repent. But he said, as I sat down, I could not think of a thing I needed to repent of that I hadn't already repented of. And so he said he got up and paced, the, paced about in the next room because he was disturbed that this word repentance had come. So when he heard me explain that the reason the prophets always tell the people to repent is because the prophets can see the new season before the season actually dawns. That's what prophets do. That's the DNA of the prophetic. God doesn't do anything unless He first reveals it to the prophet. So when a new season comes, it's first picked up on the radar of the prophetic. That's why as I began this series, I said that in 1990, as the year changed from 1989 to 1990, the publications of, of church um, materials were full of prophecies about the new season coming was first picked up by the prophetic. And so the word of the Lord, whenever the prophetic hears a new season is coming, is to repent. The word of the Lord is to repent because God wants to begin to reposition the mind of man away from the familiar, the norm, whether the familiar and the norm was just based in prejudice and presuppositions and predispositions, or it was based on more sinister things like religious uh, uh, prejudices and you know, being fixated on particular religious practices, or just demonic mindsets, or both. The Word of the Lord then up upends that, turns it over, and brings people to a mindset of repentance. A moment ago I started to say that God doesn't always tell the Western church 
everything that he's going to do, he doesn't tell us individually. And when it concerns the corporate body, he almost never tells us individually. He says, faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God, the word of, how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, and how shall he preach unless he be sent? So it, the change season is first picked up on the radar screen of man by the prophetic and they'll call for repentance. And what I was saying to my friend then was, that's the reason that the prophets are always telling the people to repent. That's the reason. They're the first ones in the economy of God to see the changed season. When they do, the word is to repent. But because even the prophets have not understood what we're saying, this word that I'm saying, repentance was always construed to be repentance from wrongdoing and sin. But repentance is the norm for the believer. It has nothing to do with sin, it has to do with a changed mindset, having a willingness to change from what you've been doing no matter how fully vested you feel you are in the present season. Because if you don't, you'll be stuck in your own economy. But when the economy of God comes, you migrate from your present season and position into that economy of God. And the first act is faith toward God, excuse me, is, first act is repentance from acts that lead to death. Because if you keep doing what you've been doing in the last season, from that point on they become works of iniquity. Because the economy that supports those works is not the economy of heaven, it's the sweat of your brow. It's the fallenness of man. And the thing you have to keep in mind here is that in the, de in the dealings of God, yesterday's economy may very well be absolutely the right thing for you to have been doing. But today's economy is totally different from yesterday. yesterday it may import essential elements of yesterday, but it is going to be empowered differently today. So this is Sam Solon urging you as a precondition of this new season to repent. Repent from acts that lead to death and begin to position yourself with faith toward God. I'll see you next time as we continue our discussion on the new season. Bless you. Bye bye. They are good for you, they are good for you, I know the plans that I have, they are good